Good morning to everyone in Sydney at the National Growth Areas Alliance Conference. I'm Greg Clark talking to you from London a few days before the conference happens and I'm looking forward to joining you live for Q&A at the end of this presentation. Let me firstly say a big thank you to the National Growth Areas Alliance for inviting me to come and join you at the conference and to share some thoughts with you. What I'm going to say to you today really focuses on the issue of Australian cities and this rather distinctive cycle of growth that they're in. As some of you will know, earlier in the year I worked with the Property Council of Australia to produce uh, what we hope was an insightful and useful report on the future of Australian cities, focusing on how they can be great. As well as this work with the Property Council, I've also been very much involved in working with the Greater Sydney Commission and the Committee for Sydney in Sydney. I've been working with the South East Queensland uh, group in Brisbane and indeed with Brisbane City Council and have also had some experience now of working uh, in Melbourne thinking about their metropolitan growth challenges. I'll try to bring all of this to bear as we go through some of the material I'm going to present to you now. To start the conversation let me say something about the context for these remarks. What we call the metropolitan century is a hundred year period from 1980 through to 2080 when the bulk of the world's population is urbanizing. We're moving over that period from being about 35 to 40 percent urbanized to being about 85 to 90 percent urbanized and uh, current debates within the scientific community say that levels of urbanization could be even higher than that. So this is humankind on a great trek from the countryside and from the suburbs to the cities, to the metropolitan areas and to the built up environment. This trek is equivalent to uh, any other great trek in human history, except that this is a story that hasn't been that well told. As you can see on the slide, uh, not only is this trek, uh, as it were, a movement of people to cities, but it's also accompanied by a number of other changes. The climate emergency, uh, the evolution of exponential technologies, the reurbanization of business and jobs, particularly through things like the knowledge economy, the sharing economy, the experience economy, and all of this, as it were, producing an unprecedented set of opportunities for cities to make their name and make their place in a new globalizing world and at the same time exposing all sorts of risks and threats that cities face. So in this metropolitan century it really matters how cities behave and it matters a lot how state and federal governments and others support cities to succeed. If we look at the 10 mega trends that are really underpinning this metropolitan century. You can see here that urbanization of metropolitan growth is matched with many other changes. And you can see that the risks of the, the side effects, the lock-in, the path dependency that can occur means that the risks that cities face during this time are acute. Let's put it in a very simple way. Not all urbanization is good. And for urbanization to be good, we have to figure out how to have good growth. It's very easy for urbanization to produce chaotic responses where the costs and consequences, the unintended uh, effects of urbanization are much greater than the positive dimensions. But nonetheless, urbanization holds out the promise of greater social mobility, increased job creation, uh, more environmental uh, efficiency in terms of travel and buildings and urbanization holds out the promise to bring large numbers of people out of poverty and into uh, an emerging global uh, middle class and, uh, and uh, uh, people with jobs that support family development, uh, encourage nutrition uh, and can alleviate ill health. So the promise of urbanization is great but producing the tools that will enable growth to be good is very important. Now we talk a lot about this metropolitan century as a century where metropolitan areas need to get organized. It's not just about Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane and Perth and the other of course great Australian cities. It's about the regions around them. 
How well are they organised? How coherent are they? Uh, is their, is their decision-making synchronised? Are their systems integrated? Do they produce, as it were, a single quality of life with a set of choices and options uh, around them uh, in each of these areas, or are they somehow fragmented or balkanized? There's a lot of research now that shows that the more coordinated, better organized metropolitan areas don't just produce economic dividends in terms of growth and productivity, which they do, but they also create much better quality of life and lifestyle choices for citizens. So it's very important to think about metropolitan areas. In the chart that you can see now uh, to my left, um, you see our way uh, of working uh, to think about the global typologies of cities that are emerging in this metropolitan century. And as you can see, I've indicated where the Australian cities are. This, this chart takes a moment or two of introducing, so please bear with me. In the bullseye on the chart, in the central area, you can see what we call the established world cities. The Londons, the New Yorks, the Parises, the Tokyos, Singapore, Hong Kong, and indeed now Seoul as well. These are the established world cities who in the previous two cycles were the, uh, the centers for corporate headquarters. They were finance, business and professional services centers, decision-making centers, and often either seats of national governments or seats of intergovernmental organization. In other words, these are the cities that in the last 30 years have wielded some kind of hard power and have used that hard power to cement their position as multicultural metropolises with a, a huge diversity of people, high level of cultural amenities. And these cities to succeed have been investing very hard in their infrastructure in order to be able to move large numbers of people around in dense and liquid labour markets. Of course, this group of cities face a particular set of problems at the moment, much to do with uh, population growth outstripping their infrastructure capacity, and therefore questions such as housing affordability, uh, uh, inequality, pollution, air quality, things like this coming to the fore. Around that bullseye, you see a, a second tier of cities, as it were, we call them the contender cities. The cities that would like to be, along with that top seven, right at the core of this new global urban system. You see, if you're at the center of this core, um, you tend to have a more diversified labor market. You tend to produce higher number of well-paying jobs you produce more tax revenues and therefore it's possible for you to invest more in the infrastructure. So many cities want to be in that group. And as you can see, our group of contenders includes Sydney, but also other cities like Toronto and Amsterdam, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Shanghai and Beijing. All of them trying to become part of a new top 20 of global cities that have these diversified economies and this diversified quality of life. Now let's take a minute or two to look at the cities on the left-hand side of this chart. These are the new world cities. We've divided them up into the innovators, the lifestyle cities and the influencers. And these cities have a very particular kind of business model. Many of the leading Australian cities find themselves in this part of the chart, as you can see. What these cities try to do is something very important. They try to combine a very high quality of natural environment often with beaches or rivers or mountains or lakes, but exceptional natural beauty is combined with a very high quality of life, often with a distinctive feel or customs or cultures, an outdoor lifestyle or indeed an indoor lifestyle, but one that really has a distinctive vibrancy to it, a personality and a character. And they put together this high level of natural environment with this distinctive quality of life together with a labour market that enables them to specialise in a small number of very high value industries, many of which are enabled by new technologies. So the life sciences, the earth sciences, material science, new energy systems, digital platforms, other kinds of industries such as screen industries or indeed higher education itself, creative industries as well, are really supported in these cities to become world-class, therefore providing, as it were, the opportunities to be in a globally competitive labour market, 
but remaining within a smaller city that's able to achieve a high quality of life. So if you like, the economic advantages of being in an established world city, but with the social and environmental advantages of being in a smaller city. Now for this model of success to work, these cities firstly need to embrace their regions. They need to be able to borrow the scale of their regions, which means that infrastructure and land use policies become very important. Secondly, of course, they need to be able to accommodate growth in an organised and well-managed way which is, achieves and retains a high quality of life. That means high amenity, medium density, high quality compact cities or city centres that are able to be integrated within a regional approach but retain, as it were, the high quality of life needed to support these leading edge industries. And they also need to be able to develop a very distinctive brand, an identity that uh, uh, associates them with the uh, high value jobs that they're able to host and at the same time projects an idea about them being a different kind of city with a high quality of life. I would suggest to you that, that Brisbane and Melbourne and to a certain extent Sydney and certainly now Perth and Canberra and Newcastle and Wollongong and a few other Australian cities are pursuing this idea of trying to be global but at the same time retaining a very high quality of life. And the observation I'm making to you today is that this requires a very particular set of tools and techniques for managing growth. You see the point is this, that all successful cities grow. It's not a choice between whether you have growth or don't have growth, it's about whether you have good growth or whether you get bad growth. So for our new world cities, good growth is an absolute imperative, otherwise it compromises their whole story about how they're providing a high quality of job access whilst retaining a high quality of life at the same time. Now, when we did our Property Council report and we looked at these issues in Australian cities, we asked ourselves the question, you know, how is Australia doing relative to other nations in terms of providing the tools to manage growth? And we produced what I think you'll find is an interesting chart here, asking how are other nations responding to the challenges of the metropolitan century? And on the horizontal axis, we're asking the question, how are higher tier governments, states, federal governments, national governments and others supporting the metropolitan areas. And on the other hand, on the vertical axis, we're asking the question, to what extent are the local governments being empowered and being given the tools themselves to succeed? So if you look for a moment at this chart, you can see that you know, it's unsurprising that Singapore and Hong Kong are in the top right-hand corner. These are the highly empowered city-states of the metropolitan century, as, as it were, a single form of government bringing together everything that's required really at the metropolitan level. And you can see on the right-hand side of this picture, countries like China doing a very good job in terms of national and provincial policies to support urban growth and metropolitan development. On the left-hand side and up at the top, you can see countries like Germany and a cluster of countries like Scandinavia, where there's been a very strong focus on providing the toolbox needed for local government and for metropolitan organisations. So my question to you today is, where is Australia on this chart? Where do you think Australia is? Is it up in the top right-hand corner with Hong Kong and Singapore? Is it on the top left-hand side with Germany and Scandinavia? Is it over on the right-hand side with, with China and, and Malaysia and Taiwan? Well, my suggestion to you is that actually Australia is down in the bottom right-hand corner of this diagram where there has been a surge of interest by state governments and by federal governments through the City Deal programme to support metropolitan areas to grow. But I think there's been a very low level of empowerment of local governments around this agenda and indeed uh, metropolitan institutions have only recently really been established and despite the fact that I'm hugely positive about the Greater Sydney Commission, the Metronet, the Metronet programme in Brisbane, the South East Queensland group of mayors, uh, in, in the Brisbane region, if I may use that language, and of course the metropolitan planning of Melbourne, most of these initiatives are actually comparatively new and they don't yet have the institutional power that they have in other parts of the world.
Now, as part of the study we did for the Property Council, we benchmarked Australian cities against a group of other cities. We picked the five largest Australian cities and we compared them systematically with five cities from what we call Smart Asia, five cities from the southwest of the USA, five German cities, five Scandinavian cities, and five Canadian cities. And what was interesting about doing this comparison was that we were not just comparing the individual performance of Melbourne or Sydney or Perth or Adelaide or Brisbane, but we were thinking about how Team Australia was performing against these other teams of cities and how it was doing. And I think there were some very interesting results that come from this. The first one to show you is really that on population growth, although the story in Australia is that population growth is, is rapid and out of hand, in fact, when you compare with these other groups of cities, population growth in Australian cities is only marginally ahead of population growth in the five Canadian cities and indeed the five cities of the southwest USA. And if we look to the future, the next 30 to 35 years, although Australian cities will grow faster than the others, their growth is not uh, an outlier in relation to how the other cities perform. And if you look carefully on the chart, you'll see that Perth and Brisbane will be the fastest two growing cities of this group of 30, and Melbourne and Sydney and Adelaide are all in the top half of this 30. So population growth in, in Australian cities is going to be a defining feature, not just of the past 30 years, but of the next 30 years. And I put it to you that uh, acquiring the tools to achieve good growth rather than bad growth is therefore going to be essential. Um, one of the observations we made is that Australian cities have a better brand and reputation than their actual performance. I won't go into all of that today, but I simply want to make the point that Australian cities have a kind of strategic risk here. That whilst Australian cities present themselves for international students and tourists and others as being fantastic places to visit, and there's an international perception of, of Australian cities that they're very high quality. Actually, the experience in terms of quality of life, what it's really like to live in Australian cities, is at least 10% to 15% behind what the brand and reputation of Australian cities is. And anybody who's ever been in business knows that you can have a, a brand that's better than your product for a short period of time and it will induce sales. Uh, but in the medium term, as people discover that the product is not as good as the brand, very deep dissatisfaction sets in and the brand can be very badly corrupted for quite a long period of time. So there is a risk here for Australian cities. There are a few other slides here showing you that Australian cities overall are lower density than the other cities. They have poorer digital connectivity. They have amongst the highest commuting distances and they have on average fewer cultural facilities than the other cities. So let me put it to you this way. Australian cities are being invited to enter into a shift, an economic transition, a modal shift in terms of transport, a land use change model in terms of densification, and a shift in terms of the kinds of amenities that people living in Australian cities enjoy. It's not just going to be about access to beaches and rivers and mountains in the future. It's going to be much more about access to uh, compact, high amenity city centres with vibrant entertainment and cultural choices, fantastic retail and of course wonderful public spaces. So Australian cities have to make the shift into that kind of model if they're going to accommodate the growth that they're going to have. Australian cities on average have a smaller innovation economy than the other cities in this study despite the fact that they have fantastic universities and you can see in this summary wheel that Australian cities are doing very well on a whole series of things to do with destination, demand, investment, the natural environment but doing much less well as I say on the innovation economy, congestion and commuting, this low density model, they're becoming less affordable and they've got much worse digital connectivity. Sorry to give you a cold shower on a sunny morning in Sydney, uh, but it's very important to highlight what this benchmarking reveals in terms of where Australian cities could uh, and may indeed fail. Now I want to go on to say something very brief about governance and then try to wind up so that we can enjoy our Q&A together. If you look at the chart I'm showing here about metropolitan fragmentation, 
what you see is that the Australian cities are the world champions of metropolitan fragmentation. Perth, Adelaide, Sydney and Melbourne are the four cities that have the smallest uh, ratio of their metropolitan population within their core city area. This is a proxy, as it were, for local government fragmentation across those metropolitan areas. You won't be surprised to see Singapore and Hong Kong uh, doing well in the bottom right-hand corner of this chart. But look at where the Canadian cities are. Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Montreal, all uh, in the bottom half of this picture, all much less fragmented in terms of metropolitan governance than Australian cities are. And despite the fact that Australian cities have highly promising metropolitan initiatives that I've already mentioned, these are yet to achieve scale and they're yet to fully bed in. Of course, they're yet to survive changes of government at both state and federal level, which will be a key test. Um, I want to say a word or two about some of the case studies that we learned a lot from. And if you look at the, uh, the slide I'm showing now, you can see that we picked cities with high population growth, we picked regions that were reorganizing, we picked national initiatives for metropolitan areas, and we also focused in our case studies on the role of the private sector as a proactive partner of cities and metropolitan areas, developing, as it were, their voluntary approaches to align with new governmental approaches. The key thing really to say about all of these case studies is that what emerges is that in the areas that are doing well, the cities that are really accommodating growth there's a high trust equilibrium supported by a level of uh, cross-party and bipartisan support that leads to metropolitan governance and metropolitan growth management tools that Australian cities are only just beginning to think about. There's also a much stronger level of proactive, trust-oriented work from the private sector, particularly in the areas of metropolitan leadership, district and precinct management and placemaking. In other words, because of higher levels of trust and better governance, all of the cities and regions and nations that we looked at have better tools and tactics for managing metropolitan and urban growth than Australian cities do. And this is a very important, I think, observation for us to make in terms of where Australia needs to go to next. Now, the next slide answers the question, why is this important for Australia? After all, after 27 years of consecutive growth, you might say, what's the problem? But I think there are very real problems that need to be addressed here if Australia is going to avoid bad growth and achieve good growth. So firstly, obviously, Australia is accidentally now pursuing a low amenity and low livability model. And as I've already said, Australian metropolitan areas are not yet well run and are therefore vulnerable to shocks. The housing affordability crisis is very clear to everyone living in Australian cities. And Australian cities as a consequence are finding it hard to attract and retain the talent they need to really host the innovation economy. And as I've already explained, if Australian cities are trying to be these new world cities which do host these high technology economies, Housing affordability is going to be absolutely critical to make that work. Dependency ratios are rising in Australia. There are fewer, a fewer proportion of people of working age actually producing uh, the tax revenues that are needed to support public services. The customers that Australia has got used to servicing, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, are becoming competitors. Their universities and others are becoming very competitive. And there's a kind of myth about a next commodity cycle that will rise all the boats uh, in Australia, uh, which we don't really believe in, in terms of either the likelihood of the revenues it would produce or where Australia will be positioned in the new value chains of the commodities that are coming forward now. So there are reasons to act in favour of this good growth equation that I've been talking about, and Australian cities need to do that now. Now, I've already mentioned what I think is some of the challenges in the political context and how that gives rise to governance challenges that then produce a weakness of tactics and tools. And you can see that we've already said something very particular about what Australian cities need, both in terms of the foundations and the mechanisms to deliver good growth.
Now our recommendations in the Property Council report were essentially about continuing to do six things that were already happening well, making the city deals permanent, increasing the acceleration of integrated transport authorities, establishing precinct partnerships, but also bringing together a new set of, uh, of innovations and tools, local government combinations, uh, new reforms in the housing market, new mechanisms for financing infrastructure, um, driving the metropolitan innovation economy much more clearly and connecting Australians' powerhouses up so that neighbouring cities can work together uh, more feasibly. And we said that Australia's next chapter has to be about integrated metropolitan institutions with longer term infrastructure, finance and investment and leadership that makes a team effort out of creating good growth. You see, our proposition is that Australian metropolitan regions need to be high amenity, medium density and multi-centred and that needs to be enabled by high capacity public transport, optimising area potential and combining that with great placemaking. So what does this mean for you as members of the National Growth Areas Alliance? Well, I think it firstly means that we must look at the metropolitan logic and organisation that underpins growth. Where are the growth areas and what are the metropolitan underpinnings for their success? We need to focus on that. Not all of the challenges of growth areas can be dealt with within the growth areas themselves. And I see a big role for city deals or city partnerships, if that's what they might be called uh, under another administration, to really focus on this metropolitan logic. The second thing is really the sequencing of infrastructure, housing and amenities. Gaining citizen trust that there will be good growth rather than bad growth is about showing them that it's possible to sequence these things together so that as new population arrives, housing, schools, hospitals, public transport and public places are all there, as it were, ready for them or coming at the same time. This requires compacts and coordination to really work and that means it's a whole of government effort, it's a governance effort to produce it. The third thing of course we need is a new story about growth and we need demonstration projects to show what good growth looks like. It's almost impossible to persuade anyone that what they will get is good growth. It's only possible to show them what good growth looks like and then to invite them to come and enjoy it. So building demonstration projects and telling a good story around growth is going to be very important. Now I personally think that in the longer term these three ideas will have to be underpinned by some other changes. The first one is local government reform. I was staggered uh, when I studied the Australian cities during the Property Council report to realise that local governments in Australian metropolitan areas are not just subjected to almost intolerable levels of fragmentation, but they also almost have no incentives to embrace growth. They don't get fiscal returns from growth that are adequate. They don't get bonus schemes that when they take additional housing or additional population, it translates into new amenities. They don't get congratulated for the good growth that they produce, and they don't get thanked uh, by their neighbours when they accept growth uh, on behalf of everyone. So we have to change the incentive structure for local government in Australia so that it gets the tools that it needs and the resources that it needs and it gets, as it were, uh, the, the support that it needs to really embrace growth. I don't see any model of good growth that can come about if it's done in the teeth of local government seeing the only logical thing that they can do being to oppose it. So reforming local government so it has the incentives to want growth and to manage growth is very important. The second thing, as I've already said, that will be required here is metropolitan governance reform. We will need to deepen the work of the Greater Sydney Commission, the SEQ Council of Mayors, the Metronet project in Brisbane, uh, the metropolitan planning of Melbourne will need to acquire a governance uh, institutional arrangement around it. And then thirdly, of course, none of this is possible without modal shift in public transport. It's rather obvious when you look at the data that Australia is almost the most car dependent country in the world. And yet we know 
that good metropolitan growth is going to mean high amenity, medium density, compact cities supported by high capacity public transport. I think it's long overdue that leaders at the federal level and the state level in Australia recognised this and began to produce a set of incentive structures that are not just about investing in public transport but actually creating the incentives for people to make the switch out of their cars and onto that public transport as it becomes available. Now what I've tried to do in this presentation is say a little bit about the conditions for good growth in metropolitan Australia. I know that the people I'm talking to are the National Growth Areas Alliance, so I know that, that this is part of uh, what you see and what is your vision and your principles. I hope this presentation has stimulated you and supported, as it were, your train of thought about what's needed in Australia, and I look forward to the Q&A with you, which I know will begin in a minute or two's time. Thank you very much.